The Mughal Empire in the 17th century continued its conquest and territorial expansion, with a dramatic increase in the numbers, resources, and responsibilities of the Mughal nobles and Manzabdars. There were also attempts at tightening imperial control over the local society and economy. The critical relationship between the imperial authority and the Zamindars was regularized and generally institutionalized through thousands of sanads, patents, issued by the emperor and his agents. These centralizing measures imposed increasing demands upon both the Mughal officials and the local magnates and therefore generated tensions expressed in various forms of resistance. The century witnessed the rule of the three greatest Mughal emperors, Jahangir, ruled 1605-27. Shah Jahan, 1628-58, and Aurangzeb, 1658-1707. The reigns of Jahangir and Shah Jahan are noted for political stability, brisk economic activity, excellence in painting, and magnificent architecture. The empire under Aurangzeb attained its greatest geographic reach, However, the period also saw the unmistakable symptoms of Mughal decline, political unification and the establishment of law and order over extensive areas, together with extensive foreign trade and the ostentatious lifestyles of the Mughal elites, encouraged the emergence of large centers of commerce and crafts. Lahore, Delhi, Agra, and Ahmedabad, linked by roads and waterways to other important towns and the key seaports, were among the leading cities of the world at the time. The Mughal system of taxation had expanded both the degree of monetization and commodity production, which in turn promoted a network of grain markets, mandis, bazaars, and small fortified towns, kasbas, supplied by a highly differentiated peasantry in the countryside. Increasing use of money was illustrated, in the first place, by the growing use of bills of exchange, hundis, to transfer revenue to the center from the provinces and the consequent meshing of the fiscal system with the financial network of the money changers, serifs, commonly rendered shroff in English, and second, by the increasing interest of and even direct participation by the Mughal nobles and the Emperor in trade. Thatta, Lahore, Hugli, and Surat were great centers for such activity in the 1640s and 50s. The emperor owned the shipping fleets, and the governors advanced funds to merchants from state treasuries and the mints. The shift in the attitude toward trade in the course of the 17th century owed a good deal to the growing Iranian influence in the Mughal court. The Iranians had a long tradition of combining political power and trade. Shah Abbas I had espoused greater state control of commerce. Because the contemporary Muslim empires, including the Mughals, the Safavids, and the Ottomans, were conscious of one another as competitors, mutual borrowings and emulations were more frequent than the chroniclers would indicate. Within a few Months of his accession, Jahangir had to deal with a rebellion led by his eldest son, Kusra, who was reportedly supported by, among others, the Sikh guru Arjun. Kusra was defeated at Lahore and was brought in chains before the emperor. The subsequent execution of the Sikh guru permanently estranged the Sikhs from the Mughals. Kusra's rebellion led to a few more risings, which were suppressed without much difficulty. Shah Abbas I of Iran, taking advantage of the unrest, besieged the fort of Kandahar, 1606, but abandoned the attack when Jahangir promptly sent an army against him. Loss of Kandahar in 1622 Shah Abbas again attacked Kandahar, and Prince Karam, later Shah Jahan, was directed to relieve that fortress. However, the prince was planning a rebellion against his father and failed to take effective action. The fortress fell after a 45-day siege. 
Shah Abbas justified its capture on the plea that it belonged to Iran. Jahangir accused the Shah of treachery and sent forces to recover the fortress. This effort failed, owing to Shah Jahan's rebellion and the illness and death of Jahangir himself. The loss of Kandahar was a grievous blow to the prestige of the empire. Jahangir, however, commanded full control over Kabul, having reinforced it now by inducting the Afghans under Khan Jahan Lodi into the Mughal nobility. Khan Jahan had close connections with the tribesmen in the northwestern frontiers. Jahangir's most significant political achievement was the cessation of the Mughal Mewar conflict, following three consecutive campaigns and his own arrival in Ajmer in 1613. Prince Karam was given the supreme command of the army, 1613, and Jahangir marched to be near the scene of action. The Rana Amar Singh then initiated negotiations, 1615. He recognized Jahangir as his suzerain, and all his territory in Mughal possession was restored, including Chitur, although it could not be fortified. Amar Singh was not obliged to attend the imperial court, but his son was to represent him, nor was he required to enter into a matrimonial alliance with the Mughal royal family. Further, the Rajput rulers of Kangra, Kishtwar, in Kashmir, Navanagar, and Kutch, Koch, in western India, accepted the Mughal supremacy. Bir Singh Bundela was given a high rank, and a Bundela princess entered the Mughal harem. Also significant was the subjugation of the last Afghan domains in eastern Bengal, 1612, and Orissa, 1617, toward the last years of Akbar's reign, the Nizam Shahis of Ahmadnagar in the Deccan had engaged the attention of the emperor considerably. The main objective of his intervention in Ahmadnagar was to gain Barar, which had been recently acquired by Ahmadnagar from Khandesh, and Balagat, which had been a bone of contention between Ahmadnagar and Gujarat. By 1596 Barar was conquered and Imadnagar had accepted Mughal suzerainty. However, the issue of a clearly defined frontier could not be resolved, and Mughal attacks continued. Under Jahangir the rise of Malik Amber, a Habshi, Abyssinian, general of unusual ability, at the Imadnagar court and his alliance with the Adil Shahis of Bijapur cemented a united front of the Deccan Sultanates and initially forced the Mughals to retreat. At this time the Marathas also had emerged as a force in the Deccan. Jahangir appreciated their importance and encouraged many Marathas to defect to his side, 1615. Later, two successive Mughal victories against the combined Deccani armies, 1618 and 1620 restrained the Habshi general. However, the Deccan expedition remained unfinished as a result of the rise to power of the emperor's favorite queen, Nur Jahan, and her relatives and associates. The queen's alleged efforts to secure the prince of her choice as successor to the ailing emperor resulted in the rebellion of Prince Karam in 1622 and later of Mahabat Khan, the queen's principal ally who had been deputed to subdue the prince. After failing to take Fatehpur, Sikri in April 1623, Karam retreated to the Deccan, then to Bengal, and from Bengal back again to the Deccan, pursued all the while by an imperial force under Mahabat Khan. His plan to seize Bihar, Ayodhya, Allahabad, and even Agra failed. At last Karam submitted to his father. Unconditionally, 1626. He was forgiven and appointed governor of Balagat, but the three-year-old rebellion had caused a considerable loss of men and money. Immediately upon the conclusion of peace with Karam, the imperious queen decided to punish Mahabat Khan for his refusal to take orders from anyone but Jahangir. 
she ordered Mahabat Khan to Bengal and framed charges of disloyalty and disobedience against him. Instead of complying, he proceeded to the Punjab, where the emperor was encamped. Jahangir refused to see him. Mahabat Khan placed both the emperor and the queen under surveillance, but he was finally overcome. The ordeal greatly impaired the emperor's health, and he died in November 1627.